Right, so I'm just having a go at using Loom. Uh, first time I've used it, first time I've really done a recording myself without an audience. Um, but I was supposed to do this talk a couple of weeks ago in Wellington. So I thought I'd have a go at doing it online um, and seeing if it's helpful to anyone. Um, although um, I may update it, I was supposed to be doing a similar talk in Melbourne. Uh, I think there might be quite a li lot more about coronavirus and screen time in there. Let's see. So the idea of what I was going to do was going to get people to introduce themselves to each other, think about the digital environment, what that looks like, think about social networks and mobile phones as the two key tools that children tend to use, the importance of conversation with children that you have in your care, um, some particular concerns that people tend to come up with quite a lot, a reminder about the importance of values and how that makes a difference to what we do, some useful resources, and then I was going to make space for... Q&A, but I can always try that on a Loom or a YouTube or something um, before too long. So, um, thinking about who we are, um, I had just put a screenshot of my Twitter up. Um, my bio has been refined and got shorter and shorter over time. I still think I might change it sometimes. Um, so, Life Explorer has been there for a long time. Um, I was told when I got cancer why don't you explore it like yeah you explore everything else so I've tried to do that I'm an author I've written uh, a couple of books I'm working on a second edition of another book and I've done various chapters I've done quite a lot of public speaking and I'm a senior lecturer in digital marketing at Manchester Metropolitan University uh, a Christian who's interested in digital culture runs a consultancy called digital fingerprint wrote the book on keep calm and carry on busy living with metastatic cancer uh, women in Academia Support Network uh, don't like having clothes which don't have pockets and I love a bit of cheese. So, you know, there's quite a lot you can tell about someone in 160 characters there. Um, so this is the book that I am working on a new edition for. I came to New Zealand um, for a two-month scholarship working on this. Uh, coronavirus has messed with my head quite a lot and all the other plans I had. Um, but this week I'm back uh, working on it. I have a deadline to get the new draft in by July so let's see what happens with that um, and one of the reasons that I call it raising children in a digital age rather than parenting is I think that we've all got a responsibility I don't have any children um, but I think I still help shape the environment that our children work within and I want everyone to have a good experience online but children in particular we want to keep an eye out for so uh, very clearly not trying to give parenting advice um, I don't feel that's my area of expertise but I have done a lot of research and a lot of reading around children on the internet talked to a lot of people and I think I can help people have a better experience online so thinking about uh, digital literacy, this kind of underlines most of the projects that I've done for the last 10 or so years within higher education, within um, churches, within schools, within uh, organisations like Girl Guiding, lots of spaces where we're looking at how digital literacy shapes things because it has become part of our everyday lives. Um, so JISC, I think, is... Um, where I go to, it's a university organisation that helps us use the internet better. Uh, also, all the um, infrastructure underneath. Um, so digital literacy defines those capabilities which fit an individual for living, learning and working in a digital society. So it's that whole thing, it's not just about skills for a job, it's about having a whole life, um, a better life. With that... Um, so there's been a lot of thought about who has responsibility for this. Is it down to uh, parents to protect their children? Is it that very individualistic view? Or is there actually a responsibility for others? Um, so with this, I was looking at Karen Brady back in 2017, where she was saying she wants to make Britain the safest country in the world for young people to be online. And that all of us are playing our part, whether that's public sector uh, social media platforms, parents and children, we all need to think about how how we do it. Um, and I'm also keen, she's talking about making people safe from online threats, but I'm really interested in how we get much better opportunities as well. If we're only focusing on the threats, it makes it kind of difficult. 
So looking online from New Zealand, um, we went straight back to the threats again. The Justice Department online um, was looking at um, how to manage uh, legal initiatives do quite often just deal with the negatives because they're trying to stop people do things, whereas education has the opportunity to maybe be a bit more positive about this. Um, but there is um, legal spaces there um to stop people cyberbullying you defaming you um all those kind of things but obviously it's very reactive so this is the exercise i normally do with people obviously it's not going to work when i talk to you uh, just this way um but i showed you what i did with my 160 characters in my bio um, and quite often that's the only bit that people see before they decide whether they're in, going to engage with me, maybe part, you know, my last few tweets. Um, sorry, uh, my email and Twitter is binging away. Uh, thought I'd turn most of those off. See, even someone who works with digital, when you're learning something new, not quite sure what's going on. Um, the UK's woken up, everyone's messaging me. Um, so what I tend to do is give people a minute to try and find, uh, to talk to someone and you need, you're need you trying to find something in common and what you tend to find is people talk about something they've done, a hobby that they've done, the family, uh, where do people live, where have they travelled to, what kind of interests they have and it doesn't take very long um, to find a connection. Um, so... Thinking about the digital environment, um, we tend to think, you know, with digital that everything has changed, but I trained as a historian originally, um, and I'm a big believer in the fact that human beings are very much human beings. There's certain things that shape us as generation, but also we shape the environment. Um, so it's, it's, it's kind of technology has given us new affordances and constraints. It's enabled us to do things. It stopped us doing other things. Um, and so we need to work out how we use that space well. Um, so this picture just made me laugh. Um, you know, 1976, that's when effectively the first mobile phone was created. But that, at that point, it was it was an oddity. It wasn't seen that this was going to be something that we did every day. Uh, one of the things I see quite a lot is this. Uh, adults say record, record numbers of teenagers are depressed. We must find out why. Teens say school is more stressful than ever. Our parents screwed over the economy. The earth is on a path to total environmental destruction. And now we have to deal with actual Nazis and, of course, coronavirus. And then adults tend to go, oh, it's the phones. It's the phones. Um, it's very easy to blame that because then it looks, it feels like something we can fix and we're not having to go and look more deeply at how we can actually deal with that um, and typically what we tend to hear from the headlines in the newspaper is it's disaster for children they're addicted to screens they're being abducted by strangers they're giving away all their information they're sexting they're running up big bills they're becoming couch potatoes they're watching porn they're meeting strangers bullying trolling and that's all we ever really hear about what they're doing online. You you get the line that go, oh, obviously internet is great, but it doesn't tend to deal with stuff well. And so I'm exaggerating, but then so does the news. Um, but we have to remember that news, by its nature, is focused on the new, the novel, the unusual, um, and it tends to present that one story as a as a whole picture uh, that we're trying to deal with. Um, so when I was first asked to write this book, um, I set off having a look at maybe what some of the reality was behind there and had 120 people answer a questionnaire. Um, I've still got another one out for this new version um, and been collecting more for that. It's so easy to blame the technology, but actually there's other things we end up blaming. Um, this article from uh, Jean uh, Twend, um, really, really popular. Um, her focus of research is really on generational differences, which I'm a little bit sceptical about anyway. The same as, you know, we didn't suddenly get into the 1970s and all start wearing flares. Um, but she's saying in uh, the, the year 2012, that's the year American ownership of uh, smartphones passed 50%. Um, and calls anyone who's born 1995-2012 iGen. You don't remember a time before the internet was to hand at all times. 
and believes that this is causing a mental health crisis um, and a generation that's putting off the responsibilities of adulthood. Um, so he thinks that because you're focusing on the phone, you're not having to deal with um, real life, you're not having to worry about being lonely, distressed, any of those kind of things, and you feel like you're not having to interact with your parents. And time on screen is equated with unhappiness. Um, bearing in mind these are self-declared levels of happiness. Uh, phones are described as an addiction, leading to lack of sleep, leading to suicide, all those kind of things. Um, and this kind of writing tends to make leave people feeling disempowered, which I find quite concerning. But it's very powerful. It speaks to a lot of people's fears. Uh, it's in a reputable and widely read newspaper, so lots of people take this on board. Uh, it kind of times with your fears anyway. It ties into the idea of moral panics, which we'll return to. So we're thinking about the end. Uh, this may be a question for another thing, but I'm just thinking particularly about the internet here. Um, if we think about early research in the internet, it concentrated very much on um, the fact that a lot of our life we're focused on face-to-face -face clues um, and that we've lost those with the internet, although of course we've now got a lot of facial interaction. Um, and that kind of academic work has filtered down to, into everyday writing. Um, and there's, you know, you've got that feeling of disaster, you've got that feeling of exaggeration. Um, but my feeling is with digital technology, we need to cultivate an attitude of respect rather than of risk avoidance. Uh, the digital is part of our everyday lives, even more so at the moment. It's not going to go away. There's huge opportunities available for those who have learned how to be critical, constructive and confident inhabitants of the digital environment. 42% of the world's population is online, with that increasing to about 80% in developed nations even more. Now, the, these figures are a little bit old. Ofcom demonstrated in 2014 that within the UK, 83% of adults were already online. And amongst 16 to 34 year olds, that increased to 98% with those aged 65 plus, the fastest growing, um, using um, tablets in particular, and learn, from that learning how to engage with other technology. Um, uh, and one of the things we're thinking about particularly now is there's a there's a fear that everyone's putting every, all of their world out online but actually much of it is moving from public broadcast to a lot more sort of private space for sharing and this is a, one of my favorite kind of images is when we think about technology we tend to blame it for making us antisocial we look at this picture from i don't know 30s 40s not quite sure what year it's from um, and everyone was managing to be very antisocial with their newspapers. So it, it's really hard when you're just blaming the technology. Um, so one of the things, uh, my favourite ever quotes, um, is this um, from Sonia Livingstone. Uh, Even though in practice face-to-face -face communication can, of course, be angry, negligent, resistant, deceitful and inflexible, somehow it remains the ideal against which mediated communication is judged as flawed. We are always comparing um, anything that's done through a letter, done through technology, uh, done through um, Skype, any of these other platforms. Um, and we're kind of measuring them as, as somehow lacking. One of my big interests is how do we actually look at how they're different? Look what they let us do. Look at what they stop us doing. And stop judging them against whether face-to-face. -face. Um, you know, particularly at the moment, yes, you can't get a hug really online, but you can get the closest you can get. Um, and one of the um, uh, uh, quotes from quite a long time ago but still feeds through in the catholic church i think is the digital environment is not a parallel or purely virtual world but it's part of the daily experience of many people especially the young social networks are the result of human interaction but for their part they also reshape the dynamics of communication which builds relationships a considered understanding of this environment is therefore a prerequisite for a significant presence there so we need to demystify that digital environment, not see it as a virtual separate space. It's a real space that needs to be understand, understood on its own terms. It's not a Wild West. It's not virtual. 
and there's real relationships. What happens online impacts offline and what happens offline impacts online. So, you know, it's thinking beyond that. And if we really want to understand what children are doing, we need to listen to their experiences and their concerns and work with them to give them the best experience we possibly can. Um, yeah, I've been invited to quite a lot of events about resilience re recently, which is quite interesting. I think particularly at the moment, we're all trying to keep our heads above water. Um, this photo has done quite a lot of roundabout, um, and originally when it was published, it was, isn't this terrible? These children are staring at their phones when there's an amazing painting behind them. And no one stopped to ask what they were actually doing. And then it turned out that actually what they were doing was looking up online more information about the painting there. So they weren't happy just with that little card that you get next to it. There was so much more information that they could get online. So we need to sometimes look beyond our assumptions. So coming back to the idea that kind of Twenge um, did with that influential article, um, you need to think a bit more. One of my first books of call always for information is Sonia Livingston's project. Um, I think it's one of the most powerful. She's very well respected. Um, based at the London School of Economics. Um, lots of long-term research into um, the digital. Um, if we're focusing on mobile phones or screen time as the damaging aspect, we're not putting time and resources into where the problems may actually be, into young people's mental health. Um, and Twenge's article is kind of equating correlation and causation, even though she does say that screen time is not necessarily causing unhappiness, it's maybe unhappy teens are spending more time online. Um, and even too much technology is clearly not the only cause of depression and suicide. And in fact, the evidence doesn't necessarily show it's a cause at all. It's all very much about how it's used. Um, so those who are suffering depression may be online a lot seeking helping information. They may be connecting with friends for to boost their mental health. Or um, they may have been growing up in homes with not a lot of attention and maybe the digital gives them that um lots more research to be done there um digital may augment things that are already happening um but large-scale research in 2012 demonstrated that five percent of teams said social networking made them more depressed but ten percent said it made them less depressed so we need to kind of think about that a lot more um We've then got a question about digital native. You may have heard this term, the idea that, you know, children are born with an inherent understanding of how to use digital. But really, we need to understand they're not so very different. Um, they're still human beings. They're not beyond our reach, which the idea of digital native makes. Um, so we need to think about how do we make safe spaces for children to be able to want to talk to us or their friends or an older peer, someone who, who's kind of helpful. And, and when they're making connections online, how do we make sure they're good ones? Um, we need to move beyond the idea of technological determinism, which basically says technology is making this happen. It's not necessarily making it happen. Uh, we can shape some of that. Um, and, and the importance of having conversation of what are the positives and what are the challenges of being online. Um, one, um, uh, David White, who was at Oxford Internet Institute, I think that's right, um, he talks more about uh, digital visitors and digital residents, and you can maybe be different in different spaces. So if you're really comfortable somewhere, you're a digital resident. If you're kind of joining in, doing what you have to do and then bouncing out again, you're more of a visitor. Um, and it, so it's less about age and more about aptitude. Um, and I still love the idea. 2012, this mobile phone contract went viral um, and it finishes. You will mess up. I will take away your phone. We will sit down and talk about it. We'll start over again. You and I, we are always learning. I'm on your team. We are in this together. So, um, it matters that we kind of understand this. Tanya Byron, author of the Big Government Report 2008-2010, 
So the more that she understood about what her children were experiencing, the more empowered she felt to support them in what they were doing responsibly, safely, and was able to give them more freedom. Kind of the same as you would anywhere else. Um, we're now 12 years on from that first report, and some of the parents may have been children at the time that this was written. So things are kind of carry on changing. So you can see, uh, despite what everyone says, um, Facebook is still the biggest used platform, followed by YouTube, followed by WhatsApp and Facebook Messenger. So you see two of the top four ones are um, private messaging, effectively. Uh, WeChat is a Chinese platform and Instagram's kind of up there. TikTok, I'd be interested to see if a couple of months later that's been growing quite a lot, so that might be even bigger. Um, so there's lots of platforms. We worry that platforms are coming along really fast, but actually there's quite a lot of static in there. So, and anything you learn about one, you're going to kind of learn about the next. Um, this, um, I was trying to find an up-to-date version of the donut, which is quite old. Um, so Facebook, I like donuts. The like button is very important. Twitter, I'm eating a hashtag donut. Hashtags are really important in there. Uh, group me, uh, don't know a huge amount about that, but that's a kind of obviously group chat app. Um, Snapchat, here's a disappearing video of me eating donuts. YouTube, YouTube, here's a video of how donuts are made. That is the biggest search term on YouTube is how do I. Uh, Instagram, very curated view, visual content um, with um, 24 hour stories. Pinterest, lots of crafting and recipes. WhatsApp, everyday chat. Spotify, music, streaming app. And LinkedIn is a CV, um, a CV kind of space. Um, and I always think with this, like electricity, you don't need to know all of this inside out. You just need to know enough to be able to connect with a um, child. Um, so this, um, We Are Social does this report frequently. Um, every year it's quite powerful they look at things um, on a global access they're really doing the content for marketing so uh, it's got its limitations but it's interesting um, so people are trying to take more self-care rather than performance online uh, there's a lot of concern about fake news um, even at the moment and um, it's starting to be recognised that online um, is is not this wild west space that you can do everywhere and again I looked at um, New Zealand uh, I thought it was quite interesting Twitter's not used massively over here um, Facebook still big I mean it's dropping you can see but it's still pretty huge um, it's dropping to around 50% very different um, and within New Zealand this is kind of numbers of what people have. 95% of people have a mobile phone at some point. 93% have a smartphone. 84% um, have a laptop. 48% have a tablet device. Um, so there's a lot of technology in people's homes. Virtual reality is still fairly new. Um, but I think you'd say that in most countries. Um, and if we look at social media in New Zealand, 3.6 million people on social media um, that's 75 percent of the whole population um, there's probably quite a lot that could be done about groupings of that um, with the certain types but uh, that was designed for conversation um, so thinking about the idea of um, when you buy a mobile phone for your child once uh, you end up giving in um, or whether you you know when I wrote my book before, 10 was seen as the first age for a mobile phone. 8 seems to be not unsurprising at the moment. Um, so yeah, uh, when you first get a phone or the before, you need to talk about budget. It's a lot easier these days because most of them are on contracts. What they can use it for, any access you might have in case you, know, you might want to help them with it. Um, Understanding what to do about security, so um, find my phone, how to turn it off, and how to try and stop it being stolen. And then knowing the consequences, if they lose or break it, do they have to buy a new one? Uh, do they lose it 
rights to something for a long time is it insured um so it's thinking about that i um i have a friend whose child if they leave their phone carelessly lying around and someone else picks it up and gives it back to the parent they lose it for a couple of weeks because that's how long it would take to get a new phone on insurance so um you might think about whether you're going to put your phone down for the whole night um lots of different things you might think about what works for you as a family there's lots of information online that people are doing um oh this is this is the one i was talking about earlier with the you will mess up i might take it away back from 2012 um if you want to look at um how that worked um and that is this conversation is really key to everything i'm saying i wrote the book originally um because people seem to be avoiding using technology at all because they thought children were digital natives um who didn't really need any help um but you wouldn't chuck your child in a swimming pool without any armbands or on a bike without the little training wheels so the more you can help them with it the better and then again there's some more contracts uh this one's for tweens um which is interesting because tweens is the 10 to 13 year olds most social media platforms are 13 plus whatsapp is officially 16 plus um i have thoughts about whether social media companies are giving themselves a bit of a get out clause but it is based around us um the copper legislation um which says um companies shouldn't be collecting data on under 13s so that's why this is supposed to work like this um and i think that if you look at this kind of thing it, it's um the more when it's kind of thinking about the positives you can do it's always good so we're back to the idea again that it's conversation 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 um some people say this is more difficult than the uh talk about sex education um i'm not sure that's so true although people may not know exactly what to say um but i think it's good to have the space to talk about it and yeah if you're going to talk about technology if you can talk about the positives and not just the negatives that's great um i'm thinking about uh, in the original book i put about chelsea clinton um and how she used to you know sit down they used to have dinner together and talk about what she'd encountered during the day whether that was radio tv whatever um, it was just a natural part of the conversation about everything else in the day uh, which meant there was more chance of any particular negatives being picked up quite fast um and it's uh, one of the things i put in my book was about the different age strands and about understanding of what's reality how you might protect at a younger age and how you're great gradually loosening kind of the space um so the children have got more independence and it's thinking about this is kind of reiterating the earlier point when people are glued to their phones they are very often in relationship to other human beings if you've been on zoom like everyone else over the last few weeks you'll see that's you know that's your conversation you're having that's your relationship you're having with the people that you maybe can't be with um um personally they're not necessarily addicted to it um although people some people have got bad habits and um, we do need to think about where the boundaries are you know do we put our phones down at night um do we buy a cheap alarm clock and i think each of us have got to experiment that's where the explorer thing comes into it again um and it's not just about um the kids it's about thinking about us thinking about how do we role model it um how do we show good use of technology do we show that we can use it in a healthy way we can use it for getting ourselves out and about we know when to put it down we know when to disengage we know um we're not going to get it right every time obviously um but quite often there's that thing isn't there where someone from the generation before will have a look at what we're doing and not understand it because it's not their normal and so there's lots of things about children that's not normal for my generation and we're trying to understand that um but i have become very used to the idea that technology and information is in my phone or my tablet or my laptop um uh, and quite often i don't really think about whether i'm online or offline i'm i'm just having a mix of it all um 
uh, and sometimes there's never a face-to-face -face element of it and that's fine um so think think about how you use your own technology what that says to your children um particularly different and difficult at the moment we've seen some great examples of people putting a sign on the door that says for the next two hours i'm in a meeting here's the answers to your probable questions um so it's learning how to balance that and, and knowing what comes first when um and so i thought it was quite interesting there was a piece fairly um recent oh that's i say recently two and a bit years ago um thing here about um young people are actually using their own smart strategies digital detoxing i've got questions about that but again i think it's a good thing to experiment with whether you try it for a couple of hours a couple of days uh, there was people in my book who tried it for um a whole year and the first month is very very um productive and then um oh, here it is Paul Miller tried it um, and then just picked up other bad habits. He found other ways to um, do things. And I think we've maybe seen this with the coronavirus. People have said, oh, I'm going to do this every day. I'm going to do this every day. And after a couple of weeks, um, just the incentive wears off. Or we're, to be honest, we're exhausted by everything at the moment. Um, and it's thinking about... Um, the thing about Sherry Turkle tends to be relatively negative about digital, but when she was talking to 18-year-olds, she was asking them if they wanted to be free of interruption, but they actually said that digital was not about interruption, it was the start of um, connection. Uh, some of them saw it as a good thing and some of them saw it as a pressure. Um, so see whether you want to give your children a bit of space and say they have to turn their phone off after 8 o'clock in the evening. might give them a bit of a... Uh, get out so thinking about some of the particular concerns that come up over and over again um, addiction we've already had a little bit of reference to this um and this is one of the things i find it really interesting is um the london school of Eco economics project interviewed twenty five thousand children and found that lots of them said it's kind of saw it as a badge of honour to say that they were addicted. We're far too quick to call it uh, what we're doing addiction. Addiction is a medical condition. Um, so we need to think about whether that's what we're actually doing. And people who struggle with addiction with digital technologies will maybe struggle with something else. They maybe have an addictive personality. Um, and I tend to think, um, I grew up without a TV. We didn't have one till I was 18. Uh, but I could be reading all day, every day. Um, we had to think about, you know, we had to put the book down when I came for dinner. I had to put the book down at night to go to bed. Uh, I was still getting the book out and trying to read it under the light of the hallway. Um, so we need to think, if we replace the word mobile phone or technology sometimes, do we see it quite as negatively? So here you've just got a brief overview of the kind of things that show that there is actually a problem with addiction. Um, some of this thing, these kind of things might be things you're seeing in teenagers anyway, mood changes as you know, their body's doing all kinds of things. Um, but really, you know, it's the, the thing has just taken over everything else. Uh, mood, moods are changing massively. We're not just talking about a tantrum when the phones gets taken away without warning. Um, and we've got to remember that children are going to be trying to push the boundaries. Um, there might be a bit about gaming later. Um, and one of the things, friends, you've got children who are into gaming, so it's really important, is to talk to them about how the game works, how long is the kind of before the game finishes each level and before you lose out if there's like a kind of 15 minute um section before all happens then you need to you need to give them 15 minute warning or or negotiate potentially um but yeah there, there is um there is there, there are a few people who are addicted but most people not necessarily and it comes to that conversation. I, I've been, I've done so many media interviews about screen time, and obviously it's a panic that people have at the moment. Um, but one of the things about digital screen is it's more interactive. They're not just sat watching a TV. They're not just consuming. They, they might be, but 
most of the time they're interacting, they're engaging, they're liking, possibly even creating. Um, you can find ways to connect that content to school, school content, but obviously we don't just always want everything to be about work. Um, give children a bit of variety, uh, some choices to make. Um, so you might have, I've got friends who've got um, lollipop sticks in a pot and one of those things says 15 minutes on the phone. The next one might say dust the bedroom. Uh, the child doesn't know which one they're going to pick out. Um, um, and like everything, I wouldn't advocate for everything being online. Um, you know, mix it up. Maybe you take the screen outside, you know, walk them with Pokemon Go or do some geocaching. Um, and we need to think about the kind of content, you know, I, I always say to friends with younger children, don't just leave them in another room with the tablet on YouTube, uh, even YouTube kids, um, you know, be at the very least within ear, ear space. Um, Cyberbullying is a massive concern for people. Um, bullying has always happened. There's a debate about whether it's worse online and offline. Uh, again I think there's a blurring you always thought when you got home you were safe but people found ways to kind of slip notes in your book or chuck a brick through the window um, but it's a lot easier to contact someone but it's also a lot easier to collect evidence of what's been done so you know every affordance and constraints quite often balance each other out um, if you're looking at those who are being bullied you know, they might be spending excessive time online they might be avoiding it in, entirely uh, might be nervous about interacting online um, could be anything up to about 20% of people who are affected in some way the statistics are all over the place depending on who who takes them uh, so we suggest you spend extra time with them help them develop their confidence don't remove the devices, that's the most important advice we get for children. Listen to them and make sure they know it's not their fault. Um, if you've got any idea, if you've been able to collect messages, that you may be looking at whether there's a way to deal with that by addressing the parents of the bully or taking something to the police. You have to kind of think. For the bully, there's a question of disinhibition. Um no easy solutions to bullies. Disinhibition is the idea there's a screen between you and the other person and you tend to forget they're not a real human being. Quite often when people see the impact they start to think a bit more. Removing access is something that could be appropriate for a bully but they may find other ways to do things. Um, and the bystander is one of the things that quite often happens online is a big digital pylon. Um, so if we can manage to help people um, by stepping in, maybe people could have a group of friends who are ready to stand in if someone's negative, set of digital allies. Um, it's not easy, but you know, I've had times when I've had negative comments and whilst I've not been online, people have already come in and said, hey, what you're saying is not okay. So thinking about that. Um, increased time spent online will most likely increase exposure to negative experiences but also the positive experiences what we need to remember is most people online and offline want to make good choices they don't want to be harmed they don't want to see their friends harmed um, we can't make their life risk free so actually how do we get involved so that they actually have the confidence and the skills to deal with problems as they come across them. I've just been reading Jacqueline Vickery's book, Worrying About the Wrong Things. She's really good about that as well. Um, always interested in who takes responsibility um, for all of these things. I think BBC has made an interesting point here don't always feel that you have to be the person that your child engages with make sure they've got a good set of friends or an older peer who they're happy to talk to uh, but also helping them understand their values um, so they may be able to resist pressure a bit easier peer pressure in the teenage years we all know, all know that's always been not great uh, then we think about friendship uh, the word friendship has changed we now friend others on facebook uh there's different levels of friendship there's close friendships and there's kind of peripheral address book friendships 
Um, but one of the things for children is they can't afford to not accept friend requests from those they in interact with in a physical space because it has repercussions for offline life. So um, there's a certain amount of pressure going on there. There's a certain amount of online etiquette that they have to respond within a certain time, who connects with who at what level, what kind of thing you like, especially as that liking is made very visible to others. Um, so it's important you kind of understand more about what's going on for them um i was having trying to find some figures about kind of um the stranger angel danger idea which is always a big fear although it's incredibly rare most most of the time um abductions and these kind of things are someone who is known to the victim less than one out of five is typically by a stranger um and if you think, if we're making friends online, how do we help them make friends safely online uh, and protect them? Most of the advice about meeting someone in another space goes with online date, um, blind dating advice that's been around for ages. You know, meet in a public place, have someone else nearby, have a get out clause, all those kind of things. Um, and I always think you wouldn't leave a child to play alone in the park where there could be someone behind a tree. So... Would you leave them on their own alone? Um, yeah, so numbers, anyone's concerning, but again, if you if they're happy to talk to you, it makes it easier. Um, again, online, what we tend to do, human behaviour is exaggerated. If you're more vulnerable offline, you're going to be more vulnerable online. Um, so it's how do we change the circumstances for those people rather than look at what they're doing online. Um, issues around porn tend to be kind of collapsed in different levels and all treated at the same. Um, and there's a lot of current content around actually our children not getting good sex education at school. So they're looking to porn for education. Um but that that is showing itself in kind of the expectations particularly guys have of women um and of course it's much easier to get hold of much more explicit and changing expectations of what's normal so i think we want to talk about what people think about porn full stop i guess um number of paedophiles who exist no I tend not to self declare um, and the stats about how dangerous they are tend to come to filtering com from filtering companies who are trying to sell you something um, and we've got to remember that technology will help you find a child as well, potentially. And then sexting, where you tend to send a kind of sexy picture. Um, I think there's the age-old pressure of if you don't send one, I'm going to ditch you. And then obviously it becomes a problem when that when that picture has left your phone. Um, you've got no control over what's going to happen. Um, again, there's debate currently about whether the law should be changed because at the moment, if a 15-year-old sends a picture to a 15-year-old, they're both effectively criminalising themselves. Um, although I think most judges are quite um, use quite a common sense approach to that. Um, if we think about monitoring, um, I'm not over keen on the kind of over shoulder thing. More of a kind of help, give confidence, still on their own. Um, so there's pros and cons to monitoring and filtering if you do it with the child's understanding and that you're more concerned about the people outside than about their behavior can be quite useful um but none of the systems really are as sophisticated as human being um so trust and helping them learn how to deal with difficult material they might encounter has got to be much better um might be of value to younger members of the family but not once they start getting to the teenage years really um and there's a bit there thinking about location services um and thinking about a digital footprint so what content what what do you leave behind when you've been online um children need some help with that as well um try not to establish a routine try not to show too much about where you live or the school you're in um, you might see people putting an emoji over the school badge that can be quite helpful and whilst not wanting to put all of the responsibility um, on individuals it's really helpful to think before you post something I also think what does God think about what I'm posting but essentially I'm thinking what will my parents think of it what do any kids that I know 
what would they think of it if they saw it if it appeared on the front page of the newspaper would I be worried or would I stand behind it and could my worst enemy do something that with what I've just posted and it's remembering that even the stuff that you put in private spaces someone could screenshot it and share it it's more about the trust relationship between people than the technology itself um, and it's also thinking about being open and a bit vulnerable but doing that with wisdom you don't share everything so I always want to remind people about values uh, our values drive our behaviours in every space online as much as offline and we need to remember that although we're dealing with screens, human beings are at machines. They not they are not machines. We are not robots. Uh, we can't work 24-7. We need downtime. We get upset. We post the wrong thing. We're going to do all these kind of things. Um, and you have to remember a lot of communication studies tend to think about um, what others have heard. It's not so much about what you said, what was what was received. So you need to take that. Um, uh, you need to kind of be able to take that into account. Um, so when you're thinking about when you're posting things, is it what you're posting? Is it true? It's not fake news, is it? Right? Is it kind? Is it necessary? Um, it might be fun, but if if it's fun, is it fun for you or is it fun for everyone? And one of the things I like, I, I kind of finished the book with Will Taylor, who was a um, youth worker at the time. I, I still like this as a summary of, for the young children, do it for them. As they get a bit older, do it with them. Then watch them while they do it, and then let them do it for themselves. You're not just leaving them to their own devices. You want to understand what and how they're using it, and not just listening to the latest moral panic that comes in the newspaper. Negotiate boundaries with them, write family agreements. There may be different levels for different ages. Um, uh, so they might understand why the five-year-old has a different experience to the ten-year-old. Talk to them, but listen to them twice as much. What's that thing? Two, two ears, one mouth. Um, be alongside them, especially in the early years, and think about your own habits as a role model. And if we're not liking what we see on social media, then we should look at it society and not just the tool we communicate with. Um, the tool does shape what's possible. I quite often say to people, if you have a brick, you can choose whether to chuck it through a window, build a house with it. So the way that the tool is shaped does make certain decisions possible. But actually, we can shape some of that. And I'm thinking beyond the individual, we need to talk to the government, we need to talk to the social media companies about shaping that. Um, one, one of the uh, acronyms that someone gave me was HALT. If you're hungry, angry, lo angry, lonely or tired, think about whether posting is the best idea or whether you need to deal with that in another way. Um, I've quite often used technology when I'm a bit lonely because that's where my friends are. So it doesn't necessarily um, mean step away. Uh, one of the other things you may hear about is FOMO, so fear of missing out. Um, so there might be quite a lot of pressure to join in on things. This feels the same as the pressure we had when I was younger. Um, but, you know, do we help our children learn how to resist pressure? Um, you know, all of these kind of things, none of the things that happen online happen in a vacuum. The culture of society around them shapes them. So some of the resource suggestions that I would have given. NetSafe is an online platform for New Zealand. Uh, it's got some quite nice summaries of um, different platforms. If you want a quick overview, only take five minutes to understand what TikTok is or whatever truly understand you need to go and have a go but you may just need you may just understand enough your child uh national online safety i quite like those they quite often have a kind of a3 poster that could be printed out quite often telling you um about um the latest platforms quite often i hear about things on things and think oh well, don't know what that is never heard of that um Gaming is one of my not so strong areas. So Andy Robertson, who writes quite often about gaming for tech mags and um, national newspapers, has produced this good, uh, book called Taming Gaming, which I think is going to be a kind of a recipe type thing, so it can be updated. So um, 
worth looking out for that. I'm looking forward to reading that. I've got one whole paragraph in it talking about Willy Wonka that I play. Um, and then I just put, because again, I was talking to the New Zealand audience, uh, Department of Internal Affairs had places where you could report things or help you understand a bit better. It's the online safety argument again. And New Zealand police, again, the police tend to see the worst of everything, so they tend to be the most don't, don't, don't. So there's a bit more information there. And then I was going to open it up to questions. So I don't know how long I have waffled on for, but I hope that gives you um, a few things to think about. And here you can see uh, my two books and one of my book chapters is in that one in the middle. And at the link at the bottom is a survey, which is open for a couple more days. Um, I've had over 200 responses already, so I'm quite pleased with that. That will turn into the new material for the book. So thank you for listening to me experiment with the loom and all the beeps and bops that have been going on in the background. Let's see what the next one looks like. <laughs>